They once asked a Jew, what's the difference between ignorance and apathy? He said, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> often, often, often people define our generation as an apathetic generation. But I would define it more as an ignorant generation. Because when you don't know, you don't care. Ignorance leads to apathy. Ignorance breeds apathy. Wisdom engenders uh, inspiration. It engenders commitment. It engenders thoughtfulness and further, further research. One of my favorite Jewish anecdotes in the world is about grandpa who sponsored his grandson's David's Hebrew school experience. And he wants to go see how his grandson is doing. So one Sunday morning, he visits David's Hebrew school located near a temple. And he walks in and he sees his grandson. He says, David, how are you enjoying Hebrew school? And David says, it's great, Grandpa. David, I'm going to ask you a question. Who broke the tablets? David looks at his grandpa and says, Grandpa, it was not me. An angry grandfather walks into the classroom and confronts the teacher. Are you my grandson's teacher? Yes, I am, sir. Do you know that I just asked my grandson, who's here seven months in Hebrew school, who broke the tablets, and you know what he tells me? I didn't do it. It was not me. The teacher looks at the man, at the grandfather, and he says, Sir, I want to tell you something. I have now known your grandson for seven months. If he said he didn't do it, he didn't do it. <laughs> an infuriated, an infuriated grandfather runs into the principal's office. Mr. Cohen, are you the principal of this lousy Hebrew school? <laughs> yes, I am. Well, you should shut it down. Why so, sir? I just asked my grandson who broke the tablets. He said it wasn't me. I asked his teacher what is going on. And the teacher says, if he said he didn't do it, he didn't do it. What type of Hebrew school are you running? You should be ashamed of yourself. It's a shanda. It's a disgrace. And the principal looks at him and says, sir, I am so sorry for your aggravation. On behalf of the board of directors, I guarantee you here right now that we will compensate you for the broken tablets. <laughs> you just give us a receipt. <laughs> and I think that in a nutshell tells the story of so many of our beloved brothers and sisters. And that's really the thrill and it's why I feel so privileged to be part of these uh, days of simple learning. We have been titled from day one, the nation of the book, the people of the book. And therefore, the book we have held dear and clung it to our hearts for millennia through thick and thin. And how cherish we must hold the opportunity to study that book and to delve further into that book, which brings me, of course, to our first topic here this evening, the first night of the retreat, namely the question of chosenness, the chosen people. And I should say at the onset that the concept of CP is not PC. The concept of chosen people is just not politically correct. In an era that champions democracy. Inspired by the ideal that all men are created equal. And today we add women. And universalism and a global community. The idea of chosen people seems to smack from so many phobios, phobias. From so many religious parochial paradigms, the modern, thoughtful, liberal, progressive, open-minded, enlightened Jew wants to stay far away 
from this concept of chosenness, especially when he or she asks the question, hasn't this idea not been a source that generated so much misunderstanding, perhaps even animosity, hatred, anti-Semitism through millennia? Perhaps we can dismiss and say goodbye to this concept of CP that has never been PC, and let us just define ourselves as human beings, as part of the human race living on this planet, trying to make sense of it and trying to get along. The famous uh, Jewish singer Shlomo Kalbach used to say that he, when he began working on campus, yet in the early 50s, he would meet a student and say, so what are you? And the student would say, I'm a Catholic. And he said, I knew he was a Catholic. And then he would meet another student and say, and who are you? And he would say, I'm a Protestant. And I knew he was a Protestant. And then he would meet a young student. And who are you? And she would say, I'm a Buddhist. And I knew she was a Buddhist. And somebody else, a Muslim. And somebody else, a Hindu. And then I would meet a student and say, and who are you? And he said, I'm just a human being. And I knew that he was Jewish. <laughs> They tell the story, the old anecdote about Dr. Tversky, a famous psychiatrist who's going on an airplane. And on the airplane, he's dressed in the classic Hasidic garb, the large black round hat, you know that one? The long black coat, a square white beard, and a woman sitting on the airplane turns to him and speaks in Yiddish. And she says... So lib dear Habenzeon's fight, because of you they hate us. Can't you be normal? Can't you people dress normally, behave normally, speak normally, live normally, and then the world will tolerate us? It's human beings like you who always aspire to stand out that engender so much anti-Semitism and misunderstanding. You are a disgrace to the people. When will you ever be normal? The rabbi looked at her and in a perfect British English says, Excuse me, ma'am, which language are you communicating in? I fail to comprehend your verbiage. I am Amish. She's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I thought you were Hasidic. He says, no, there are similarities in the look. I am Amish. She says, wow, I really respect the Amish. He says, why? She says, you know, you are such a minority, yet you maintain your heritage with such dignity and pride. God bless you. Keep it up. It was now his turn to respond in Yiddish. And he said, Aha! given Amish. If I would have been Amish, you have nothing but words of respect for me. But since I am Jewish, you are embarrassed by me. I bless you that one day you should be able to appreciate within your own people that which you appreciate in others. This conversation is not uncommon on one level or another, in one form or another, in today's Jewish world. The famous Jewish comedian Jackie Mason always tells about his shows. And I hear this from him personally in a personal conversation. He said, I sit, I make all these jokes about Jews. The Gentiles are sitting and having the time of their life. And then you ask a Jew, how was it? He says he was good, but too Jewish. <laughs> it was Gricho Marx who said, I would never be a member of a club that would have me as a member. And so, let us tackle, at least begin, to tackle this titanic issue, no pun intended, of chosenness, of the chosen people and address a few questions. Is it racist? 
I saw whoever wrote the byline to my speech was somehow suggesting that it may be racist. What does it mean to be chosen? Does history verify this idea of chosenness? And what are its implications for our lives as humans, as Jews, as Americans or Canadians or whatever your host country is, whatever nationality you're part of? I presume most of us are from the United States of America, at least I am. But whatever your nationality is, what is the meaning of chosenness within that context? So number one, is it racist? Number two, what is the meaning of this idea? Number three, does history verify it in any way? And number four, what are its implications for our lives today? Let me begin with one, I think, very important observation, not only about this topic, but really about life. We have become extremely uncomfortable talking about people being different from each other. We feel that that just breeds um, isolationism and maybe misunderstanding racism and ultimately violence. Thousands of years of history have demonstrated to us that because of people seeing themselves as superior to other people, countless lives have been denigrated, oppressed, abused, and sometimes slaughtered. Till today, in many parts of the world. You're not of my tribe, you're not of my religion, you're not of my family, you're not of my faith, you're not of my territory, you're not of my clique. And therefore, we want to do away with all differences. We want to say, and it comes from a very good place, the liberal mind says, there are no differences between people. And the moment we hear that word, chosen people, our fuses go off because here we go again. We want to eliminate once and for all any differences in the hope of creating genuine equality. But there are two very important points to remember, and that is equality that is based on the notion that people are not different from each other is as deep as our faith that we are all identical. And the moment we reveal that that faith or conviction may be skin deep, there goes our equality. In other words, let's say I find out that I am different than you, or you are different than I. Can we still respect each other? Can we still love each other? Is there still equality? Or equality is based only on the fact that everybody is exactly the same. If it's really based on the fact that everybody is exactly the same, we are in bad shape because if we ever find out one day that some people are different than other people in one way or another, whatever way that may be and how you want to define it, does that mean there's no room for respect, for, for, for honoring each other, for camaraderie, for brotherhood? Judaism, therefore, looks at it very differently. Judaism says there are no two people who are the same. There are no two human beings who are the same. But we are still deeply committed to respecting each other, not because we're all equal, but despite the fact that every person has strengths that somebody else doesn't have and weaknesses that somebody else doesn't have. The question is not whether we're equal or not. The question is what we do with our strengths and how we view somebody else's weaknesses. There's another point, namely, if we ignore the differences between people, what happens if I have a flaw that you can help me deal with? If I cannot acknowledge that I have a strength that you may not have, and you have a strength that I may not have, I cannot give you what I am capable of giving you, and you cannot give me what you are capable of giving me. So essentially, we undermine everybody when we say that equality is based on the fact that every person is exactly the same. There's absolutely no differences. Of course there are differences. There are biological differences, and there are psychological differences, and there are chemical differences, and there are emotional differences, and there are spiritual differences, and there are genetic differences. The question is not that there differences. The question is what we do with those differences, how we view those differences. What do these differences do to us? How do we respond to them?
And if I have a gift that you may not have and you have a gift that I may not have, do I see that gift as an opportunity to denigrate you or do I see it as a responsibility to share with you and you to share with me? That is a much more mature, wholesome and authentic way of looking at humanity and looking at the needs of humanity. No two cultures are the same and no two tribes are the same and no two families are the same and no two siblings are the same. I am not my brother, I am not my sister, my brother is not me. My mother is not my father, trust me. And by the way, take marriage as the best example. Often people get married based on the idea that the honeymoon is going to last forever because we are a perfect match. We just love being with each other and talking on the phone for 17 hours a day. Remember those days? And then suddenly you get married and a few months later you realize, hey, we're not completely identical. You know, he loves carbs and I love protein. That's a small example. You know the story, the Jewish couple that was celebrating their 50th anniversary. And she gets up and says, I want to make a toast to myself for sticking it out with him for 50 years. A toast to him for sticking it out with me for 50 years. I want to tell you, 50 years of our marriage have passed like two days. People were amazed, a Jewish couple after 50 years, not only are they on speaking terms, but apparently the marriage was so romantic and heavenly, it flew by like two days. There was one nudnik in the crowd, he raises his hand and he says, Excuse me, ma'am, why do you say your marriage for 50 years has been like two days? Why don't you say it was like one day? I told you he was a nudnik. She says, because our marriage for 50 years has been like two days. Tisha B'Av and Yom Kippur. <laughs> the two toughest days in the Jewish calendar. Marriage cannot be based on the fact that you're equal, that you're alike in everything, that you have the same taste, the same idiosyncrasies, the same mishugasen. Trust me, he's more mishugah than you will ever imagine while you're dating. <laughs> Marriage comes from the thrill, the mystique, the excitement and the drama of creating a relationship with somebody who is not like you with somebody who's different than you, with somebody who has strengths that you lack and weaknesses that you lack as well. And in the give and take process of a relationship, we both enrich each other if we are vulnerable and are open to the fact that neither of us is perfect and we must learn from each other and complement each other and allow each one of us to expand our horizons by creating space in our heart for otherness. Isn't this what every young couple should be told? So bring them here. Rather than you're equal. And this is a very important idea in Judaism, especially in Jewish mysticism. It's not true about, it's true about relationships. It's true about humanity. It's true about Jews and non-Jews. But it's also true about siblings within the same family. So we should not get uh, swept up in the notion of equality when it really undermines the idea that humanity is based on diversity. In fact, the entire universe is based on diversity. God could have created one species of birds. He did not. He could have created one species of mammals, one species of fish, one type of flat plant, fruit, and vegetables, hundreds of thousands, millions, and billions of species. It's in the diversity of the world in which we experience its full majesty, its full grandeur, and depth. And the same is true when we want to address the topic of the chosen people and the role of the Jewish people in our world. And now when people often say, racist, chosen, you were chosen, they weren't chosen, you were chosen, the Jews were chosen, and what about the non-Jews were not chosen? I think the notion of racism really does not belong into the, does not enter into this discussion for a very simple reason. Jews are not a race. <laughs> you have Jews from all types of races. You have Jews who are black and Jews who are white. Jews who are oriental and Jews who are western. You have the Yemenite Jews 
And you have Jews who don't even know what schug is. And you have other Jews who don't know what gefilte fish is. So the Jewish people include human beings and members of all races. Besides the fact, as we know, anyone in the world of any race and any ethnic group and with any gene pool can become Jewish if they want to. It's called giyur, it's called conversion. So when you say the concept of, of Jews or the chosen people is a race, first of all, Jews are not one race. They include many diverse races. And number two, any single person from a Jewish perspective, if they wish, they don't have to. We don't believe as in Christianity, there's no salvation outside of the church or in Islam. Everyone has to be a Muslim to find the grace of God. It's Maimonides who famously declares from the Talmud, from the Tosefta, that Hasidim Sa'olam, the good people among all the Gentiles, have a portion in the world to come. But besides the fact, anyone who wishes to join the Jewish people, I don't know why they would want to, but anybody who wishes to join the Jewish people, Berava, Pajalista. You know what Pajalista means? That's English for welcome, please. Actually, Russian. <laughs> but let's, let's go one step deeper and one step further. Should I educate my children? Should you educate your children or grandchildren with a sense of internal pride in their individuality or not? What do you think? Should I tell my boy, my girl, you're just like every other person in the world. In fact, there are 7 billion copies of you and you may actually be a waste of time. Obviously not. What I want to teach my child, and I try to teach my child, and the Torah emphasized this numerous times is, of course there are 7 billion people in the world, as I speak, another million born in China. But you are unique, as is every single person. In the famous biblical words in Genesis, every human being was created in the image of God. And the Talmud says, no two people look alike, no two people think alike, just like no two flakes of snow look alike, because every person has a unique face, not just physically, but also spiritually and emotionally. So there is something unique, and you should be proud of who you are, and feel comfortable with who you are, and not feel that you have to emulate anybody else. They once asked a woman who lived to the age of 104, what is the value of living to this point? And she said, no peer pressure. <laughs> one, of the greatest, one of the greatest struggles in life is, is I have to emulate you. I feel the need to make the bar mitzvah just like you made the bar mitzvah. You have this counter and this kitchen. I need this counter and kitchen. I don't have to elaborate on this concept. However, it's also true internally. We compare ourselves to other people and it's one of the greatest tragedies in life because the essence of life is you have to make peace with yourself and embrace your true identity, your true calling and have pride in that and inculcate your children and your loved ones with that pride. And pride is not bad. Pride is not evil. When does pride become negative? When does pride become evil? When it does one of three things. When it leaves no room for other people. When it blinds you to your own weaknesses. And when you start believing there's nothing greater than yourself. That is when you have to start becoming fearful of pride. So if you're, you come over to me and you say, Rabbi Jacobson, God chose me. And as a result... There's no room on this planet for anybody but me. And by the way, I never make mistakes. I'm perfect. I'm flawless. I'm impeccable. As somebody once told me about somebody else, he's a self-made man and he worships his creator. So there's no room for anybody else on this planet. 
I never make mistakes, and there's nothing greater than me in this world. This is a pride that you have to be fearful of. This is a pride that can lead to hatred, to insensitivity, to a lack of tolerance, to disrespect, to oppression, and ultimately to violence, to persecution, and sometimes to annihilation. But let's now ask this question. When the Jewish people say we're the chosen people, or let me put it differently, the Jews never say it, Jews hate saying it. When the Torah says that God chose the Jewish people, what's the next sentence? What's the, what are the ramifications? Does God say, I chose you and therefore remember? She doesn't like what I'm saying. Okay, children know the truth, I guess. What's the next sentence? Does the Torah say, you're the chosen people, hence, leave no room for anybody else on this planet. Get rid of everybody, beginning with your mother-in-law. Unless she's Jewish. Next statement. God says, you're the chosen people and therefore Jews. You never made any mistakes. You're impeccable. You're flawless. You guys are perfect. That's exactly what the Bible says, right? About the Jews. <laughs> or does the Torah say, you're the chosen people and there's nothing greater than you guys. Your ego is infinite. The idea of chosenness within Judaism not only doesn't have these messages, but it's exact opposite. In fact, one can say that the essence of Jewish chosenness is appreciating the fact that because you were chosen by God, therefore, you must create room for other people. Therefore, you must be extremely honest about your shortcomings and mistakes. Therefore, there is always something greater than you. And here... I want to describe to you what I think we often misunderstand about this whole concept of chosenness. And if we can just uh, digest this point in the lecture, besides the jokes, which are the most important, I think maybe we can have somewhat of a paradigm shift. And here I ask you a question. Try this out. Ask a Puerto Rican. I love the Puerto Rican. Are you the chosen people? Well, sure, what's the question? Ask an Italian. Are Italians the chosen people? What's the question? Who do you think invented pasta and pizza? You'll ask the Japanese, are you the chosen people? Of course, they say they're the chosen people. That's why the sun begins rising in Japan. The British, <laughs> sun never sets on the British Empire. The Chinese, of course, they think they're the chosen people. Ask any Arab, are you the chosen people? Of course. Now ask a Jew. Just go over to a Jew coming out of Temple Emmanuel on Yom Kippur. Is it true that you're the chosen people? Me? Never. I'm just a human being. Why are we so allergic? Why are we so uh, timid? Uh, not timid, why are we afraid? History, true, is one thing even more and perhaps even deeper. And that is because we're the chosen people. Let me explain to you what I mean. There are two types of chosenness in this world. There's when a king chooses somebody to be close to him. There's when a queen chooses somebody to be close to her. A monarch, a man or woman of great power and authority, chooses you or a group of people to be closer to them than anybody else. That's one form of chosenness that exists. I don't only have to use the example of a king. It could be any man or woman of great power and leadership or success. And they choose a group 
to be close to them and say, I chose you, that's one form of chosenness. What happens when a great king chooses you or a group of people to be close to them? You look at yourself and you say, hey, I'm chosen. I have been selected to be close to this person in power. I am obviously elevated. I am obviously in a different league. And there is a sense of hubris. There's a sense of, of self-inflation. Here, in our case, we're talking about God choosing the Jewish people. And that has the exact opposite effect. Because the first thing we know about God is that God is infinite. And what happens when you are in the presence of infinity? You feel small. What happens to your wisdom, to your skill, to your power and prowess when you're in the presence of an infinite God? You look at it and you say, wow, I'm very small. So being chosen by God to be ambassadors of God actually bursts your bubble rather than inflates your bubble. If a mortal human monarch chooses me and says you're close to me, then I feel greater than others. But when God chooses me and says, here, you are my representative in the world. You are my witness in the world, in the words of Isaiah. You are my ambassador in the world. You are chosen to share me with the world. What happens to those people who were chosen to experience God in an intimate way? What happens is they suddenly experience themselves as nothingness. Because in the presence of infinity, there is nothing outside of infinity. So I look at myself and I say, what am I? I'm just an extension of the infinite. I'm just part of the infinite. There goes my arrogance. There goes my ego. There goes my hubris. There goes my self-inflation. Being chosen by God has the exact opposite effect of being chosen by a person. Being chosen by God means you were chosen to become nothing. Hooray! Chosen to be absolutely humble, to experience the naught and nothingness of your existence, to realize that you are nothing but an extension of His infinite light and infinite presence and infinite wisdom. To realize that my entire life and my entire existence is simply an extension of infinity. And I have no identity outside of His. So to experience God, the closer I am, the more chosen I am, the more humble, the more nothingness I experience. So, when a Jew says, I'm chosen by God, and therefore I feel so much greater than you, I am. I'm arrogant, and for good reason. This has nothing to do with being chosen by God. This means he chose himself to choose himself to be arrogant. The word ego is the acronym of easing God out. When you experience closeness with God, what happens then to you is you become the most humble human being on earth. And that's why Moses, who spoke to God constantly, the Torah says, was the most humble person who ever lived. Why? He split the sea. He gave the Torah. He led them out of Egypt. He did the ten plagues. How did he feel more humble than everybody? And the answer is, the closer you are to God, to quote the words of the Tanya, kol hakarav karav yoiser, yoiser keloi. The closer you are to God, the more you experience divinity, the more you experience that you are nothing in the presence of infinity and you're just a conduit for the infinite light, the more humble you become. That is why when you look at the Jewish people and you say, are you chosen? And every Jew will say, me? Never. 
We don't like it. You know why? Because we were chosen by God. And therefore we have that sense of inadequacy, that sense of nothingness. So when I come over to a Jew and say, is it true you're chosen? And he says, me never. I say, wow, I know you're chosen. I just saw it. I just heard it. And this is true about every time we speak about God choosing us. Now look at Jewish history. For the most part of Jewish history, what did this idea of chosenness do to the Jewish people? What did it do for them? Did it turn them into a bloodthirsty, arrogant people who felt that it's their right to exterminate everybody else? Did it turn them into an arrogant people who never criticized themselves? Did it turn them into a people who gave no room for anybody else? People scream, chosenness is racism. But one second. I know that millions of Jews have been slaughtered by their enemies who said, you know why we're killing you? Because you say you're chosen. So I ask you a question. What would you choose? Somebody who says, I believe everybody is equal. But when somebody says they're chosen, I will slaughter them. Or somebody who says, I'm chosen. And what did the choice do for them? It inspired them over thousands of years to be a light unto the nations. It inspired them in most cases to be faithful citizens and to introduce ethics and morality to civilization. It inspired them to enhance life, to bring salvation to humanity through every possible form and blessing and gift they can. It empowered them to give charity and to give and give and care for others as much as possible. Whoa! To quote Lincoln, General Grant is taking something. I wish every one of my generals would take it. If this is what chosenness does, then I wish more people would experience themselves as chosen. In fact, you can say the Jews were chosen to teach every human being that he or she was chosen in their own way. The Jews were chosen just for that, to teach that God's presence is within every person and that every person has a unique and indispensable mission to life. And this is a sign within ourselves. When I open up the Torah and it says, I am a member of the chosen people. Chosen by whom? By the creator of the world. Oh, when the creator chooses you, it's a very different experience. That means you will become the most humble human being, the most vulnerable human being, the vulnerable in a good sense, the human being who is most open to self-critique and growth and criticism, because if you're chosen by God, meaning to experience God, you will experience your nothingness in the presence of infinity. So now you ask, is chosenness racism? And I say, any person from any race can choose to become a member of the chosen people. There's only one condition. They have to be ready to burst their own bubble. They have to be ready to become nothing. <laughs> and if they make that choice, they can join this people who was charged with the mission and the responsibility to experience something that is very, very profound but not easy. And that is that we are constantly living in the presence of infinite mystery. And when you're living in the presence of infinite mystery, there must go your ego. There must go your defense mechanisms. There must go all intolerance that comes from the fact that my ego cannot create space for your ego. The more chosen, the smaller, the humbler, the more respectful, the more tolerant the more loving, because it's chosen not by a mortal king, it's chosen by God. They tell the story that in the middle of the Second World War, there is a city in Romania called Kloisenberg. Kloisenberg had a Rebbe, a spiritual master, who was known as the Tzanze Kloisenberg Rebbe. He just died a few years ago, in 94. His name was Rabbi Yekusil Yehuda Halberstam. When the Germans 
took over Kloisenberg, they immediately, as was often their pattern, to display their sadism towards the Jewish people, and they gathered the Jews of Kloisenberg, and they had the Rebbe march to the center. And an SS commander went over to the Kloisenberg Rebbe. And giving him a smack, he says, So, are you the chosen people? And the Kloisenberg Rebbe looked up and said, Most certainly. He took his rifle and he shoved it into his chest. The Rebbe fell down. Are you still the chosen people? And the Kloisenberger Rebbe said, yes. He now took the rifle and punctured the Rebbe's body with it. He was now gushing blood. Do you still believe that you are the chosen people? And he said, yes. So he now took his boots and he kicked the Kloisenberger Rebbe in his head. The poor man who was frail, who was weak, but a holy man, was now in a river of his own blood. And he said, you madman, you idiot, how can you believe that you are the chosen people? Look where I am and look where you are. And with his last strength, he looked up and he said this. As long as you are the ones beating, murdering, gazing, exterminating, innocent women, children, and men, and we, the Jewish people, have not laid our finger on an innocent person. As long as you are the beasts murdering innocents, while we are merely the victims, not murdering any innocents, I know that we are still the chosen people. I know that we are still the chosen people. This is how they experience their chosenness. In the presence of the angel of death, in the presence of endless blood and violence where ordinary human beings would be reduced to skeletons, and would lack the last vestiges of human dignity. Here was a person or he or she still maintained that sense of human dignity and responsibility and said, as long as we're not murdering innocent people, we're being murdered, we're not murderers. I still have that sense of pride of what is the meaning of our existence in this world. Then you look at history and you ask a simple question. Why the need for all these concepts? Why the need to get into this whole discussion? Granted, you explain that being chosen by God is not about feeling superior to other people. On the contrary, Chosen by God means that you are an ambassador of God. That means you feel your humility in the presence of God and you feel your responsibility towards other people without your ego getting in the way. Granted, but why even the need for that? But when one studies history objectively, we notice two incredible facts. Number one, the obsession of humanity with this nation called the Jews, and number two, the influence of this nation, the Jewish people, on the rest of the world. The obsession is till today something that staggers one's imagination. From the day Abraham was born in 1948, since creation, till today, the story of the Jewish people have not left the front page of the Greek times, the Roman times, the New York times, the Assyrian times, the Babylonian times, and the Egyptian times. 
Till today, a little country, Israel, the size of Dallas International Airport, is one of the most important stories. Panama is larger than Israel. How often do you read about Panama? Indonesia has how many people living there? 300 million. You read about it once in seven years when there's a tsunami. Israel has seven million people. Front page every day. Compared to all the Arab and Muslim states, it's like a match on a football field. And yet, all the video cameras are zoomed into that match. And that match is blamed for almost every and any problem, not only the Middle East, but in most of the world. And it's not only today, since the creation of Israel in 1948. It's been like this since 1948 of the creation of the state of Israel. It's been like this since 1948, since creation when Abraham was born. We don't know how to play little league. We're always playing big league. We don't know how to get onto side stage. We're always in center stage. A Jew sneezes on a mountaintop in Israel and it's front page news. In this way, thousands of years, we do not constitute even 1% of humanity. We're like 0 0.08 or something. You know, they say, how many Chinese are there? How many? They say, around 2 billion Right? And there's an argument, 2 billion and 16 million, or just 2 billion? You understand? So an error in the Chinese census, that is the number of the Jewish people. And yet, when you see the role they played in history, you wonder why. That's number one. Number two, you look at the influence of the Jewish people on history. A band of slaves that left Egypt transformed civilization. As Thomas Cohill, an Irish Gentile, brings out brilliantly in his book, The Gifts of the Jews. Or Paul Johnson, another Christian, in his book, The History of the Jews. Jews have been the most transformative force in all of civilization. The very concept of morality, of ethics, of monotheism, of purpose, are Jewish inventions. President Adams wrote, I know no more important concept for the survival of humanity than the concept that there is morality, there is right and there is wrong. Who introduced that to the world? This little nation of slaves. I look at the gas chambers. I listen to Ahmadinejad from Iran whose one objective in life is to exterminate every Jew. Say what? Why? I have no way of explaining it. Concept of the chosen people. I know our noses are not that beautiful. I know we like sushi. I know we like golf. Some of us. I know some of us like Chinese food. I know some Jews are rich and some Jews are poor. And some Jews believe they're chosen. But that's not a reason to create gas chambers and crematoriums. There is something that the nations of the world felt about the Jews and still feel about the Jews that we don't feel about ourselves. And I have no way of explaining it in any form but with this concept of the chosen people. The Jewish people were chosen thousands of years ago. For a unique destiny. Namely to become the ambassadors of the creator in the world. Of the, of the world in our world. It's a chosenness that doesn't create racists. It's a chosenness that creates profound humility, respect and love. And the urge for unity. Realizing that there's something that transcends me. And there's something that unites you and I. Which is our Mutual creator. And so, 
finally. I was speaking the other day to young Jewish students and they asked this question. What does it mean to me today that I am the chosen people? I live in America, I live in a free country, I have many non-Jewish friends and I shared with them this insight. I said, imagine, imagine, okay? You're driving on the highway, right? You're on the highway, there's traffic. Suddenly you look out the window and you see right near you on the 95, you see right near you on the highway, an airplane. You look up, you tell the pilot, open your window. He opens the window, says, sir, what are you doing? He says, what are you doing? I'm stuck in traffic just like you. You're like, sir, you're supposed to fly. You're not supposed to drive on the highway. He says, no, 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 I want to be like everybody else. I want to drive. You say, sir, you'll never fit into anybody else. You're this big airplane. He says, okay, I know what to do. He starts cutting off a wing because he wants to fit in. So you ever saw a plane missing one wing? Looks a little awkward on the highway among BMWs, no? So you're like, sir, you still look weird. So, okay, I'll cut off my second wing. Cuts off his second wing. You're still too tall. Okay, I'll shrink. I'll shrink. I'll, I'll, I'll well the airplane. And as much as he does surgery on the airplane, it still never fits in. And at some point, the people on the highway say, just get out of here. You don't belong here. He says, but I don't have wings. And they say, what a pity. You weren't made to drive on the highway. You were made to fly. You were made for us to point to our children and say, look, look at that airplane. That's what you were made. And by putting yourself on the highway, you injured yourself, you maimed yourself, and you can't even benefit the cars who sometimes need to fly to the National Jewish Retreat, and they need a plane and not a car. And by you becoming a car, you don't allow anybody to fly. Friends, you understand the parable, and that's the story of the Jewish people. We were chosen to fly. The world expects of us to fly, to be able to help the entire world fly. May you have a successful flight. Thank you. Click subscribe to see more exclusive content for the most sought-after Jewish speakers, teachers, and thinkers.